speaker and uh, observatory director Chris Dupree, my longtime colleague. Chris has um, been at Agnes Scott for 25 years and uh, has been teaching and uh, researching and outreaching and observatorying <laughs> and all kinds of wonderful things. And um, it's my pleasure to, to give a brief introduction to him. He's a, uh, a radio astronomer who does some, um, has an expertise in massive star formation and obviously has uh, done a lot of um, science writing on a variety of subjects, actually has a, um, a book project and, and a couple of things you may be familiar with from the past. Anyway, um, Chris is going to give us an overview of the, the Bradley Observatory a retrospective of, of the Bradley Observatory. And I will uh, just let you know that um, it is our privilege to be hearing from, um, from Chris tonight. And after 25 years with us, he's going to take a pause and uh, go on loan to the National Radio Astronomy Observatory for the next two years. And he'll be um, working with them. And uh, so you will, uh, if you you know, really want to hear him talk. This is your chance tonight. So I'm glad you're here <laughs> to uh, to hear from Chris. And then, you know, we'll look forward to seeing him again in a, in a couple of years. So Chris, it is all yours. Thank you, Amy. And um, I, I'm not sure, I think I mentioned this last month, uh, but uh, Amy is going to be on sabbatical next year. So so this will be the first year <clears throat> uh, in a, quite a while that neither Amy nor I are here. But I just want to reassure you that you'll be in very good hands because uh, Ed Alban, who is a planetary geologist, he's an expert on Mars and who had a very uh, successful career at Fernbank Science Center, is going to take over as the interim observatory director next year. And so Ed Alban will be in charge. And um, we're just delighted that, that he's going to be here to be guiding uh, open house events and, and outreach activities next year. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. All right. Can everyone see that, hopefully? Okay, we're good to go. I'm gonna put the little Brady Bunch grid of people over here. So I, those of you who have your cameras on, I really appreciate it. It's nice to see your faces um, in this uh, isolated time. Chris, I forgot to ask you, do you yes. want to hold questions to the end or if um, if people have questions as you go along, do you want to be interrupted? Um, I'm more than happy to have people interrupt. So if you want to maybe um, be between Rachel uh, Emmett and, and Professor Lovell, if um, if you want to just put something in the chat, if it looks like something that we should pause, um, put, please feel free to just uh, pop in and, and stop me. I, I don't follow the chat well when I'm presenting. So um, if I miss something, hopefully some other pair of eyes will be on that. So yeah, that's okay. fine. I'll, I'll interrupt you if anybody has a chat question. So participants, okay. if you have questions as he goes along, don't be shy. We will, um, you know, we'll get your questions in. And if you have anything that you don't mind waiting till the end, of course, we'll have time for questions at the end. Okay, back to you, Chris. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I decided since uh, it's the last talk of the year and it's the end of my 25th year here, and it's uh, the observatory's 70th plus year here. It's kind of a good moment to stop and pause and look back on the, the life of this observatory, which has been a uh, part of the campus and part of the community for, uh, for over 70 years. And so what you see here <clears throat> on this first slide is a picture of the observatory on the cover of Sky and Telescope back in 1950, which is kind of cool if you think about it, right? Uh, a tiny uh, college, tiny women's college in Atlanta had made the cover of Sky and Telescope in 1950. Um, and then of course, our beloved observatory there and a lovely photo from our communications department where they, you know, it's like those, uh, those pictures of bowls of cereal that just look so appetizing because they make them just look so delicious, right? So you could almost eat the observatory up. It looks so delicious uh, in that picture. So uh, tonight, a uh, uh, quick word of welcome. And uh, I'm very, very glad you're here. Thank you for taking the time out. I mean, I can't imagine a diff more difficult decision to make than to get on Zoom at 8 p.m. on Friday night. So the fact that so many of you have been here in the course of the past year, I really appreciate it because I know this has been such a tough year, um, but we've really tried to uh, provide you with some interesting uh, thoughts on astronomy over the past year. And uh, I hope and pray that come fall, 
you will all be welcomed back with open arms uh, with tea and coffee and cookies at the observatory on Friday nights. So uh, first of all, I just had to say that the, the landing of the SpaceX Starship was pretty incredible. Um, they had many dramatic failures. Uh, you may have been following this. This is the spacecraft that is uh, the prototype for landing, for going back to the moon, which, uh, spa which SpaceX has just been chosen by NASA to be the ones to build the spacecraft to do that, and eventually to Mars. Um, I was, uh, if, you, if you just, uh, after the talk, if you just are interested in this, uh, Google, um, you know, uh, SpaceX Starship, and uh, you'll find cutaways and interiors. It's really cool. They're, you know, this this craft, the one that landed, that took off and landed, will be able to carry about a hundred people uh, to Mars per trip. So it's it it has a much bigger capacity than any other spacecraft that's been built. And this is sort of the top of the rocket, right? So you imagine if you go to Mars, you stick this on top of another one, uh, and it, you know, if you go to the Moon, you put it on top of a sort of another smaller one. So this is the top part of a rocket that would be the part that would actually land on the surface of, of Mars uh, or the moon. Um, please stay around after my talk tonight because um, uh, Sophia Gooch is gonna give a Stellarium slash Planetarium show. Um, if you've been here in past months, you know that this is just a short um, pale reflection of what we love to do much more, which is to host you in the observatory and at the Delafield Planetarium. But it really um, has been a lifeline. And Professor Lovell actually started some really important work last spring, working with the students to, to learn how to use the Stellarium software. And it's just been an incredible resource that we've had available. So um, uh, I'm grateful to, to Professor Lovell and the students who got started on this last, last spring. And then um, the students, Leo Scare and Sophia Gooch worked on this actually through the summer and into the fall. And, we have a whole bunch of shows that are available now, um, and Sophia may, might mention that later. And then finally, I just I have to mention, since we are in finals and we're almost at graduation, we have six uh, graduating seniors. Um, their names are listed here. Um, the majority of them are in astrophysics. Um, we have one in math physics and, um, oh, and one in astrophysics, misspelled, uh, I see. So that's my fault. Uh, <laughs> that's not actually a separate major. That's a typo on my part. Um, we also have with us tonight Emma Dalton, who is this year's William A. Calder Award winner, and uh, congratulations to Emmett. And also, um, we, we each year, and for the past few years, have been awarding a uh, Georgia Space Grant Consortium NASA Outreach and Teaching Fellow, and Leo Scare and Mahika uh, Rao, who are graduating seniors, were our winners this year. So I just, you know, this is a time for celebrations and endings. I just wanted to make sure to mention uh, all of them. And also to uh, thank Leah Owenby and Emmett Dalton for working so hard all year long um, to get all these organized um, and to get our emails out, et cetera. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the observatory. By the way, I haven't worn a tie in forever, so this is pretty big deal here that I'm wearing a tie. Um, I, I really think the observatory is, is a living example of the liberal arts. And um, what do I mean? Well. Uh, I found this quote from Encyclopedia Britannica that says, in the medieval European university, the seven liberal arts were grammar, rhetoric, logic, which is called the trivium, geometry, arithmetic, music, and astronomy. That's the quadrivium. And I've always thought that the quadrivium in particular, right, geometry, arithmetic, music, and astronomy just come together beautifully at the observatory, right? I mean, when you walk up the hill, you see all those almost platonic shapes of the hemisphere of the dome and the cylinders and the, the, the rectangular solids that make up the architecture of that beautiful building. We have the plaza out front with all of its intersecting lines and curves. And then uh, we have music, which I think has been a big part of the observatory ever since Bill Calder was here you know, 70 years ago um, into the current day when we've had such a lovely partnership with the Department of Music in presenting our William A. Calder Equinox concert. So uh, I, I, I love the way in which the, the observatory building itself and the activities in the building in particular, I think are a real wonderful example uh, of the liberal arts. And what's been constant throughout the whole life of the observatory that I, I hope I'll be able to show you tonight is you know, teaching, outreach, and research have always been a part of the life of the observatory. Um, you can see there's a picture there of, uh, you know, guests in the planetarium. 
there's some musicians playing up in the front. That's during one of our Calder uh, Equinox concerts. In the bottom right, we have our graduating senior, Azia Robinson, with a group of students out on the plaza. It actually makes me sad to see it because we haven't had kids at the observatory in a year and a half now. Um, Professor Lovell and Emmett and others, I mean, we've all participated with having those, you know, bright young faces at the observatory and that was always uh, very energizing. And then uh, the, the little Instagram update in the middle, um, which I'm not a big Instagram person, but this is a, a scientific result from a group of students I've been working with this year. Uh, Zia Robinson, uh, Jingyi Zhang, uh, Mahika uh, Rao, and Natalia Garza Navarro. We worked together on um, some radio data, and NRAO just released a little plug about the, a little press release about it on Instagram. So I was excited about that. And I also was excited to see that my, my daughter, Matilda Moore, liked it. So that made me very excited. I don't know how she saw something from NRAO. It must have been that it was on my feed. So, but I'm never on Instagram. Uh, and so the, the observatory has been around uh, it was, since 1950, that's when it first opened its doors. And one of the things I've been doing uh, is I've been trying in getting together some of these materials is I've been pulling together a lot of old stuff that I inherited when I arrived at the observatory that I'm gonna turn over to the library. So the library can preserve these things better. Um, there are a number of uh, newspaper articles throughout the past seven decades that talk about the fundraising and how the observatory was built. Uh, you see here that it was, uh, it was planned to be $65,000, uh, turned out to be an $85,000 building. So it was slightly more expensive than they planned. And you can see here an architect's original sketch, which is quite true, of course, to the, the, the first part of the building, right? There was a big addition that happened in 2000, but that was the fundamental part of the building. I noticed in the original architect's drawings that they had railings up on the roof, which would have been really nice. That apparently those were value engineered out of our beloved observatory. Um, and and the, the, the building, I mean, I've talked about the activities in the building, but, but the building itself is aligned with uh, the world in some very fun ways that students notice uh, when they are here for several years. One of the alignments is that uh, over the front door, right? I think you can see, uh, let's go back here. Uh, you can see this glass here, right? See that glass over the front door? There's some lovely leaded glass over the front door. So uh, twice a year on the fall and spring equinox, that uh, star is lined up right on the pillar that is in the room behind it because that, that face of the building faces due west and there are only two days of the year that the sun sets due west, right? It's either north of west or south of west and it comes back to that point on the spring equinox and the fall equinox. So whenever I'm you know, at the observatory at the time when that happens at the right time of year, uh, it's always sort of a, a lovely moment, uh, especially when there's some nice orangey light in there. And then the plaza itself uh, functions, you know, it can function as a sundial. Um, and, you know, if you stand at the center of the plaza, your shadow sweeps across the plaza clockwise, right? The direction that a second hand ticks, because that's the direction that a shadow moves in the course of the day. And those were some of our first timekeeping tools that, you know, those first technicians were making little clock hands move in the direction that they recalled the shadows moving. Um, and this aerial view of the observatory, you know, like any big building, it's not all that attractive when you look at it from above because it's a walkable roof, right? Uh, but we, you can see the solar panels that are here on the back part of the building that provide a very tiny amount of power, but some. <laughs> uh, and I think it's, uh, a, both lovely symbolism that we're trying to generate some of the power that we're using that building. And also it's a good learning tool. Students have used those, uh, those solar panels in some studies for various classes um, in looking at how they generate power and how their uh, angular placement is, is sort of optimized. So I said I was gonna talk about 1950 to the current day, but I have to just say a few words of prehistory, right? Because uh, Agnes Scott's connection to astronomy actually goes back before the building of the observatory and before uh, Bill Calder. Um, Anna Young is a, a very famous um, alum of the college and faculty member at the college. Um, she was a professor of mathematics, physics, and astronomy 
for uh, about 10 years. And she taught some at the University of Georgia as well. And she took a leave of absence to actually go get her master's degree in education at Columbia University. She actually died quite young and very tragically in 1920. So um, her career uh, as a professor was, was cut very short. And at around the same time, there was another uh, professor at Agnes Scott who was uh, Charles Olivier. And Charles Olivier was the founder of the American Meteor Society that he actually founded when he was in Atlanta. And he was a professor just for a short time for a couple of years at Agnes Scott. And um, in 1912, he, <laughs> I've always loved this article. I'll show you a little snippet from it. He, he made uh, observations of a nova, which is a sort of brightening star that had been noticed. And the quote is with an opera glass at Agnes Scott College, right? So he was out there somewhere, uh, I guess not in the woods so he could see the sky with his opera glasses. And then actually in 1914, um, like I'm gonna do for a couple of years, he moved to Charlottesville and he actually went to Charlottesville to UVA uh, where he had studied and became a professor. Um, here, here's the actual article. There, I wanted to show you this because um, the astronom in the Astronomical Journal uh, over a hundred years ago, articles were quite short and efficient. This is the entire article. Uh, if anyone has read scientific articles these days, even the tiniest result requires four or five, 10 pages, right? Um, so it's highly efficient, but here's the quote that I love. Uh, the observations of Nova Geminorum 2 were made either with either an opera glass or an eight centimeter telescope by myself at Agnes Scott College, Decatur, Georgia, July, 1912. So I, I've just always loved this because it, it, it helps me to kind of see the span of the connection of you know, this part of campus, even before the observatory was there, uh, there was uh, Charles Olivier uh, making his observations. And uh, he's, if you look up Charles Olivier, he's quite famous because of his, fo his founding of the American Meteor Society. So um, in the intervening years, uh, after, after uh, Annie Young passed away and uh, till World War II, um, Agnes Scott had, uh, and I haven't filled in all these details for this talk, but um, there, were, there was basically one professor of physics there during that time, and there were various professors who rotated in and out, uh, men and women. But um, in, in the late 1940s, after World War II, um, Agnes Scott College, because they had hired a, a new faculty member, a young guy named Bill Calder, um, they were interested in acquiring a telescope. And so um, this is actually the advertisement from Popular Astronomy for the Beck Telescope. Uh, and you can see down here, it says the Heavy Mountings by Warner and Swayze, a big company that was out of Cleveland, Ohio. And then it says uh, optics by optical parts and tube by J.W. Fecker. So that's this big part here was the tube. Um, this is a high quality photograph. I've been getting some photos from the library uh, of the telescope when it was being retrofitted. So they acquired it for the, at the time, massive sum of $15,000 and actually had to spend almost $20,000 kind of retrofitting it and correcting it. If you're familiar with the telescope, there's a little detail here that you might notice. If you see the, the mounting here and then the telescope, it's flat right here, right? So that, that connection is flat. Well, when you look at a picture of the telescope later, I want you to notice what's different right there. And we'll talk about that. Um, because the telescope was, was actually used uh, north of here, and that'll sort of explain what's going on. So the, the telescope uh, looks very much like this. In fact, the, the retrofit that our colleague um, Peter Mack is doing right now, he's basically hidden all the wires. I don't know what he did with the wires, but uh, you can barely see any wires hanging off it now. So it's a very tidy retrofit. Um, there's a wireless connection to the computer, so it's, it's quite lovely. Um, he was having some encoder issues. So hopefully he's uh, sorted that stuff out today. Um, so uh, one more thing about the purchase of the telescope. Um, there were two bidders on the telescope. Uh, one was Agnes Scott College and one was the Soviet Union. And um, it turned out this was the late forties. If you know history, you know that relations were not good between the US and the Soviet Union at this time. And in fact, there was an export embargo for technological equipment, which this was considered. And so the Soviet Union actually won the bid, but couldn't take delivery. And so the next bidder was Agnes Scott College. So 
Agnes Scott College got the telescope in 1947. So Bill Calder arrives uh, at Agnes Scott College and um, was a very uh, dynamic and popular teacher of astronomy. And he got the president at the time interested in this idea of building an observatory. And so uh, fundraising got started. It was President McCain at the time. Uh, and, and fundraising uh, was successful. And there were uh, companies that donated sort of in kind and donated equipment. And um, this, is, this is one of the architect's sketches of the observatory, very close to what it finally looked like, right? And, you know, it has that look of a 1950s building, right? Uh, sort of almost like a, a ranch style home with a dome on the top of it. <laughs> uh, built in brick, uh, you know, some of the details of the windows changed, but essentially this is the shape of the observatory. It looks like there was a little bigger part planned over here. I don't, I'm not sure what that was. This, this part didn't happen because the walls go straight back. Turns out uh, we did an addition in around 2000 that added, of course, the new Delafield Planetarium and uh, a new kind of back part of the building, which is if you've been to the observatory where we have tea and cookies, uh, that part of the building the tea and cookies edition, we'll call it. Uh, so, so the 1950s uh, were, were very important years because these were the years uh, right after the dedication, uh, you know, the construction and dedication of the observatory. And <clears throat> the, the, uh, the Atlanta Astronomy Club, which you may have heard of, is a pretty active amateur astronomy club, was founded by Bill Calder in 1947. And one of the things I've been perusing the past week are it you know old uh, are are old um, installments of the Atlanta Astronomers Report, which you can tell when you look at them, they're hand typed on a typewriter, right, <laughs> and uh, put together. And the covers are mimeographed. I didn't quite capture the color here, but they're that kind of purple mimeograph color you might remember from school days if you're as old as I am. But you can see in this picture, right? It's a lovely picture of Bill Calder and his dog Stormy, who was quite popular on campus at the time. The two of them ran around together. Stormy used to ride with uh, Bill Calder on his scooter uh, around campus. Also, if you visited the observatory, um, you'll notice that uh, you know, the, the mechanics of the, the right ascension and declination uh, lock knob and this back end of the telescope are identical, right? None of this has changed. Um, the observatory, the telescope has has been updated in terms of how we know where it's pointed and how we drive its clock drive. But basically, the mechanics of the telescope have not changed uh, since 1950. You can see here some sort of 50s era technology, right? Photometers that are strapped onto the back of the telescope, uh, some electronics here. So there were other uh, things were controlled in different ways, sort of once you got the light out of the telescope. Um, the, the observatory, uh, again, this is when it was featured on the cover of Sky and Telescopes. It was actually featured that fall when it was built. And I want to say a few words about this man right here, which is uh, Bill Calder. Bill Calder uh, arrived at the college in 1947. He stayed there until 1972. So um, uh, I, I have this year been at Agnes Scott College as long as Bill Calder was here, which is very weird uh, to think about at times. Um, this is a lovely etching that was made at the time the observatory was built, and I still have some of the original etched cards, you know, that are sort of hand-pressed uh, etched cards. And uh, one year, I, I actually have one copy left. The Christmas card from the college from President McCain was that uh, etching uh, of the observatory. Uh, I believe it was the Christmas of 1950. So, um, a few things about Bill Calder. This isn't a talk about Bill Calder, but you can't have a talk about Bradley Observatory without mentioning him because he's such an important part of its history. Um, he was a very skilled astronomer. He was a student of Harlow Shapley, who was a very famous, well-known astronomer uh, in the early part of the 20th century. He was a very talented musician. He played uh, violin and he also played the harp. You saw the picture of him on the harp there. Um, and he was just a passionate advocate for astronomy. He, he loved talking about astronomy. He, um, he, got, he got things to a point at one point in the early 50s where um, almost half of the students at the college uh, were taking astronomy at some point in their career at the college. Um, he, as I said, he founded the, the Atlanta Astronomy Club in 47. 
uh, it might have been 48. Um, and he founded the Observatory Open House series. And, and here we are today, right? Uh, 71 years later, carrying on the tradition that he started. He is the namesake, of course, uh, of the uh, concert that we do twice a year, the William A. Calder Equinox Concert Series, which we started in 1998, uh, along with the Department of Music. And, and he was very funny. Uh, I've been reading through some of the newsletter things that he wrote. And this is just a little outtake from uh, actually this issue where he talks about going uh, out to observe in North Georgia. And he says, having been perplexed about the limits of visibility, particularly of dark nebulosities, the entire staff of the Bradley Observatory, my dog Stormy and I, went on an expedition to Toxaway Mountain in North Carolina, altitude about 4,700 feet to study the Milky Way. So, I mean, he, he was a, a charming person. I, I never met him in person, but uh, one thing that makes me happy is that um, I arrived at the college in 96, and in 1998, we dedicated a plaque to Bill Calder in the building. And so there's actually a plaque, if you walk in the front door of the observatory, there's the original plaque uh, about Bradley Observatory. And then around to the right, there's a plaque that sort of uh, um, honors his, his career. And one of the things that we did in 1998, he was quite ill at the time and couldn't attend, but we, we had a, an event. We had a musical event. Uh, some of the faculty who were here when he was here came and played and talked about Bill Calder and we recorded the whole thing and we sent it to uh, him and he was able to watch it. And so it, that made me happy that we were able to do that. He passed away uh, soon, soon after that, uh, within a few months. Um, so the 50s were kind of everything getting started at Bradley Observatory, the beginning of the open house series, uh, the growth and enrollment in astronomy. Um, and the 60s, uh, this, this continued and actually some, some significant research started at Bradley Observatory. Um, at this time is when many, many people I've heard from over the years I've been here uh, came to the observatory as kids. And uh, I got this great email not too long ago that I just want to read to you. It says, hello from Somerville, South Carolina. I grew up on Avery Street in the 50s and 60s and attended the public viewing nights at Bradley Observatory. One of the professors was Dr. Calder. He went downtown with my grandfather and me to pick out a telescope for me at Rich's department store. We bought a 60 millimeter refractor and Dr. Calder carried it out himself. I have so many pleasant memories of viewing with the 30 inch reflector and I'm so glad to see what I remember is still there. Perhaps I'll be able to attend a public night in the future. It would really be fun for me. John C. DuBose, PhD, Chemistry, Emory. So some kid uh, got inspired to be a scientist uh, by their experiences and, you know, by the, by the clear sort of open dedication that Bill Calder had to a young kid interested in science, uh, which, which is, I just think, a very heartwarming story. Um, this article on the left is written by um, Catherine Johnson, class of 47, who passed away a few years ago. Um, she was a very uh, highly renowned uh, Associated Press reporter. And um, this is a short piece that she wrote about Bill Calder. And uh, the, with the one quote is actually from the very beginning. It starts, if you graduated from Agnes Scott College before Dr. William A. Calder came to teach and before Bradley Observatory was built, you know you were born a few years too soon. So. Uh, you, you can see from this the kind of love and dedication that, uh, that many students of that era had for Dr. Calder. Um, in the 70s, the, the observatory uh, sort of carried on. Dr. Calder retired in the early 70s. A professor named, named George Folsom came. And actually, a professor who's now retired at Georgia State, Dick Miller and George Folsom, did a bunch of observations of what are called blazars uh, with the Beck telescope. Um, you can see here, this is George Folsom standing behind the electronics. There were some new electronics put on. This is the new kind of control electronics for the, uh, for the telescope. And uh, in 1976, I think I have that year right, it could be 77, um, uh, Dr. Art Bowling joined Agnes Scott College and um, has, uh, he, he is also an emeritus professor now uh, of the college. But you can see in this, you know, it's sort of a publicity photo, but you can see that the Beck telescope uh, at this point had been repainted white. And I want you to notice this little thing here. See that, that little wedge? That wasn't there before. 
that wedge had to be inserted so that the telescope's axis still pointed at Polaris, right? So what happens is that when you move south, the North Star gets closer and closer to the horizon. And so you have to put a little wedge in and the angle of the wedge is the difference in latitude between here and Philadelphia where the telescope was before. So that wedge is one of the, the retrofits that happened um, when the Perkin Elmer company retrofitted it to be used at the college. But if you've been up there, you know, uh, th this, <laughs> this taller stair uh, has been replaced, but we have one that looks just like this now. Uh, we have another lower one. But, you know, the, the, the geometry of the space, of course, can't change. This is all poured concrete. And we've renovated the building, but um, uh, the dome is the same. The shape of the room is the same. Um, this is a little outtake from a paper, actually, that, that Dick Miller and George Folsom uh, published. And so I just want to kind of point out that here we are, 1974. Here's Agnes Scott College uh, contributing to a research paper in the Astronomical Journal again, just like in 1912. Uh, from Charles Olivier's paper. And uh, I plucked out the line from the paper where it says the optical observations, this source, PKS uh, is a radio source, PKS 1514 24. And there were radio sources that were seen to be fluctuating in brightness. And so the, the goal was to look at the same sources with an optical telescope and see what you saw. And so it says here, the optical observations of AP Libre, which is uh, the same as the source PKS 15, 14-24, were made using the 30-inch reflecting telescope of the Bradley Observatory, which is located on the campus of Agnes Scott College. And these were Kodak type 1030 plates. So these are photographic plates, right? So uh, uh, the younger members of the audience may or may not know this, uh, but at least astronomical photography was all done on glass plates, right? So you would have a coating on the plate, you would put the plate in place, you would expose it just like an old camera film, and then you would develop those plates. And actually, um, when I arrived at the observatory, the darkroom was still there with all the old plates in it. Um, and in fact, we've just gotten many of these plates now from Georgia State, from Dick Miller, and we have them stored at the observatory. So we have a lot of these uh, observations. All right, I'm gonna pick up the pace here. Uh, the 1980s, uh, Halley's Comet came by in 86. Uh, Professor Amy Lovell was at the college from 85 to 89. And uh, she rightly points out that if you add up her four years as an undergrad and her 21 years she's been here now, she's been here as long as I have. So we have to count her undergrad years uh, as well. Um, near the end of the 80s, the telescope was moved to Hard Labor Creek. And actually, you may or may not be able to see it. It's kind of a dark photo. But the, this is Professor Alberto Sedun. Uh, he actually was a very nice guy. He looks a little bit menacing in this photo, but it's the only photo of him that I could find. Uh, and some students from Agnes Scott, they're actually looking through a, a C14, which is a Celestron 14 inch telescope. So when, when the Beck telescope, when I arrived, the Beck telescope wasn't there. It was actually still out at Hard Labor Creek. And, and it was very sad to go up into the dome because there was this quite small <laughs> telescope, although more modern telescope. So it was probably useful uh, in, in other ways because it was a little bit easier to manage. Um, but on that, uh, uh, the, the pier and everything else had moved out uh, and all that was there was a 14 inch telescope. Um, this is Bob Hyde who was at the college. My years may be slightly off here. I think these were the years Bob Hyde was at Agnes Scott. And I think this is Julia Stahl. I'm not positive. Someone can correct me here. If that, I, I, I would bet some money that that's Julia Stahl. He, um, he wrote a very uh, famous book on constellations that was used a lot um, when teaching constellations to students. He was also had a career uh, at Fairbank Science Center. Um, and there's, uh, this is another picture of Bob uh, Hyde. You know, throughout the years, uh, the newspapers locally would sort of take a little interest in the observatory. Uh, and this is a, a, an article from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And I just liked this. I liked the opening a lot. It's written by uh, Sharon Bailey. Uh, it says, outside the Bradley Observatory on the tree-line campus of Agnes Scott College, the moon formed a delicate luminous circle worthy of a line in an Emily Dickinson poem. And that's a pretty nice way to start an article, I think. But then there's this great line that it says, Bob Hyde jokingly delivered some explicit instructions to five freshman astronomers, don't swing on the telescope, okay? 
uh, if you've been up with a telescope, you know it has a lot of inertia and uh, it can sort of carry you up off the ground if you don't have a lot of mass yourself. Uh, so we get to the 90s, uh, and, and this is um, when I arrived at the college. Uh, I arrived in 1996, and um, one of the first things I did was, uh, there was there was this idea that the college campus needed to grow, that we, we needed new uh, science buildings, we needed a new library, you know, all the buildings that are there now. And so um, along with Art Bowling, we wrote uh, a fairly short thing. It was just two pages called A Proposal for the Future of Bradley Observatory. And um, one of the things that's fun in looking back at it now is that we, we did all those things. We, we were able to accomplish all those goals that we set in 1996 or 1997, which was, which was exciting. One of them was the return of the Beck Telescope. So that returned in 1998. Uh, it came back to Agnes Scott College from Hard Labor Creek. Um, that's the year we started doing the Equinox concerts and we actually started the planning process for a big renovation of the observatory. Um, uh, the 1999-2000 school year, we were shut down. We were renovating the observatory and building the plaza out front, the Celestial Spheres Plaza. And uh, if, if any of you were coming to open houses that year, that was sort of a sad year. We had to have our open houses somewhere else on campus. Uh, we were over in, I, my office was in Dana. We were having open houses in Campbell. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a tough year. Uh, we lost a lot of our audience that year because of course, you know, one of the big draws in coming to an open house is going to the observatory. And the observatory was uh, behind a high fence. Um, this is an image of, uh, sort of representing the, the, the concerts that we've been doing. And uh, this is a pianist who's actually been at the observatory once and did an online concert. If you uh, were here in the fall, you saw um, this concert, uh, lovely piano concert. This is a drawing actually of, um, of the plaza. And this is from Terry McGeehee's design. So Terry McGeehee and I worked together to design the plaza. And this is one of the working drawings. Um, I believe Terry must somewhere still have all the evolutionary steps of the design, which did change over time. And I wasn't able to find all of those. Uh, if you didn't see the observatory during the construction, I just wanted to show you a few pictures. Um, this is all I could find. This is actually the metal ribbing in place for the uh, addition of the um, planetarium and sort of out behind the observatory. Uh, this edition now is sort of where we have the, you know, the restrooms, the seminar room, telescope storage, LIDAR room, all those things. This opening here is actually where the old uh, planetarium was. That was it. It's tiny. Um, it could only seat 12 people. Uh, it was a lovely little space, but it, it was, you know, not big enough for the groups that we wanted in our aspirations. Uh, this is just a little more detail of the drawing. You know, so this, this comes quite close to what the plaza uh, eventually looked like. The scale of these um, planets is not quite right. Uh, this one, if you've been out there, you know that it actually kind of impinges on those two circles, right? It it's, has to be a little bit bigger than this band. Um, but that's the basic look of the plaza design. And what's on here, which was important for the pricing uh, and design of all it, uh, is the, the specific type of stone or marble that was used, right? So there's American Red Dragon, uh, blue pearl is for all the planets. And of course, it's mostly field stone, which is good because otherwise it would be like an ice skating rink. It's already slippery. Um, I know Professor Lovell uh, has to walk across this in the winter sometimes when there's snow. And if your foot hits one of these polished pieces, uh, you'll, you'll slide until your foot hits that field stone and then it'll kind of stop you. Hey, um, Chris, we have, a, we have a question in the chat. Yes, um, yes. Uh, why was the Beck Telescope moved to Hard Labor Creek and how did we get it back? Oh, good question. So it was moved out to Hard Labor Creek in, in the interest of making, of keeping it an active research telescope because, you know, um, the, this was before the era of CCD cameras and um, it was at a time where the idea was in order to have a useful telescope, we needed to put it at a remote site. So it was moved out to a dome uh, at Hard Labor Creek. The problem is, um, there was also part of the move was Georgia State made a commitment to retrofit the telescope with encoders and with a new mirror cell on the back. Um, and that part of the project never really happened. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know all the details, but what I know is when I came back to Agnes Scott, 
we had a 14 inch telescope sitting in the dome and the Beck telescope was unused out at Hard Labor Creek. So since it wasn't being used, um, Professor Bowling and I uh, advocated to bring it back. And fortunately the college agreed that it should be brought back. So we, we brought it back and actually Peter Mack, who's at the observatory right now, in fact, just tried to call me, I hope with good news. Um, he did the retrofit in 1998. And so, uh, we, we had the telescope back and working, and the idea was that we would just use it as a historical telescope, right? We, we wouldn't worry about necessarily it functioning as a research telescope. And um, this, that's a great segue, actually, to this slide, because the 2000s, right, the 90s were this era of kind of getting the telescope back, um, starting up some of our new programs. And in the 2000s, we really uh, started to provide some research opportunities for students at the observatory. So. One of the things that we did uh, was, of course, we, we dedicated the observatory. Um, a colleague of mine and I, Loris Magnani, who's at uh, UGA, uh, founded the Georgia Regional Astronomy Meeting. And this is a meeting that's happened actually every year since 2001, uh, even through the pandemic. It survived the pandemic. Um, and this is a, a meeting that's intended for, uh, for Georgia area astronomers to get together. Um, the LIDAR facility, uh, again, which would be another whole talk, so I'll just say very briefly, it's a, it's a laser that allows you to probe the Earth's atmosphere uh, above Atlanta. And so this was a collaborative project with Georgia Tech that was funded by a National Science Foundation grant written by uh, Dr. Art Bowling. Um, and so that provided some really great research opportunities for students who are interested in optics and in, in laser research. We joined the CERA consortium, uh, which is down here at the bottom in 2006. And that gave our students access to telescopes uh, around the world. And actually there were two telescopes at the time, and now there are three telescopes. Um, on the 400th anniversary of the telescope, um, it was the International Year of Astronomy. And we actually participated in that. Um, um, we had a large installation that was at the airport, which were astronomical images. And uh, in fact, included an image at Hartsfield International Airport of the observatory. So uh, I was quite proud that we snuck in this uh, publicity for the college at Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, where I don't know how many millions of people pass through uh, per year. It's a lot. Um, one of the things that, that was an outgrowth of this was uh, the Metro Atlanta solar system. And so I've mentioned the plaza design before. What happened in 2009 was that we actually connected the plaza to the entire city. And I'll tell you a few things, uh, just a few words about that. This is an example of the size of the Georgia Regional Astronomy Meeting. This is the meeting that, uh, as it was held at Georgia Southern. Uh, this is maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, we also have an alum, uh, Jill Carson, who's a graphic designer. She's the lead graphic designer at Wake Forest. And she actually designed our, um, our Bradley Observatory logo or Mark, I don't think I can call it a logo, our Mark. Uh, and uh, we were able to put that on t-shirts and on coffee mugs. And uh, as you know, if you've been to the observatory, we sell those at open houses, which we have not been able to do this year. Here's another one of the lovely, um, delicious looking versions of the observatory at night where it looks so lovely and attractive. So the Metro Atlanta solar system, uh, the idea is that we took the sizes of all of the planets to be the scale system, right? So we took this to be the scale and we said, okay, if, if Mercury is that size, how far away would it be? If Venus is that size, how far away would it be? And we found locations all through Atlanta where we could put each of the planets in their orbits. And so uh, this is at Decatur High School because it turns out that the distance from the plaza to the Decatur High School is the Sun-Venus distance. There's the poster of Venus, and here's the description of the whole Metro Atlanta solar system. Uh, Mercury is located in the student center, and this is the image of Venus. So each of these images is located somewhere uh, in the city of Atlanta, and each location has this poster on the right. right? This is sort of the finding chart. And what turns out to be kind of cool with the scale size, which turned out was complete dumb luck, is that the inner planets all fit into the city of Decatur, right? Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Earth is at Decatur uh, Public Library. Mars is at the seminary. 
And then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are located at Emory, Georgia Tech, the airport, and Sweetwater Creek State Park. So next time you're out at Sweetwater Creek State Park, uh, go get a drink at the water fountain at the visitor center and look up and right above the water fountain is, uh, is the image of Neptune and the description of the Metro Atlanta solar system. So the past decade, uh, we've, we've tried to keep going with a lot of these sorts of developments. Um, we dedicated a, a student research space where students could make observations with the CERA telescope in 2012. Uh, in 2015, we, uh, I think, thereabouts, uh, we installed those rooftop solar panels. We've had the amazing support of the Georgia Space Grant Consortium, uh, which has really helped us grow our outreach, has paid costs for speakers and uh, cookies and coffee um, and, and our, all of our outreach activities. Um, just in the past five years, we had a big update to the planetarium. We had to do a, a major sort of computer control system upgrade. Um, around about 2017, Professor Lovell can correct me if I'm not quite right. Uh, she and Professor Ackerman got very involved with the ham radio station that we now have active at the observatory. In the last few years, um, we, we were able to survive COVID by continuing with our outreach program. Um, we joined a consortium called Radial, which is a, a, a group of institutions uh, that are not R1 institutions, right? So a lot of small liberal arts colleges um, that is a consortium where radio, radio astronomy uh, research is sort of made accessible to those colleges. And one of the things that I hope to be able to continue in the next two years when I'm up at NRAO is um, fostering those sorts of connections uh, with with the radio consortium and uh, providing opportunities to students for research in radio astronomy. And uh, up to the current day, literally tonight, uh, we are upgrading the Beck Telescope Control Electronics. So um, we, we, we've arrived at today and um, we are still working hard to keep that old telescope uh, operational and, uh, and fun to use for visitors. So, the goal is, right, when, when, we, uh, when you're able in the fall to come back to Bradley Observatory and uh, take a look at the Beck Telescope and hopefully all will be well uh, in the fall. Um, this image on the right, uh, I just wanted to add this in. This is a, a image that a student drew and I, I just put this in here because I wanted to emphasize that um, through the years, right, uh, students have been dedicated to the observatory and have really uh, loved what it represents. I think it's been an oasis for a lot of students, right, away from uh, the rest of campus. Uh, we have students in normal times uh, up there studying and working together all the time, and, um, and hopefully that can now continue. So uh, just to finish up, to talk a little bit about the future, um, as I keep repeating, you know, we, we hope and pray that things will uh, uh, open in a normal way uh, in the fall. We're gonna, we, we've been working to continue to sort of make our outreach program more accessible. Um, uh, a couple of the students who have worked on our outreach programs in the past few years have been uh, very dedicated to the idea of making uh, outreach accessible to uh, students with, with uh, uh, various needs, including, you know, students who are visually impaired, students who might have hearing impairments, um, <clears throat> students who might uh, need an environment, right, that, um, that is not overwhelming, right, because the planetarium environment can be a bit overwhelming for students with, uh, with um, sensitivity issues. And so there are all sorts of ways in which we can make the observatory more accessible, and students have been at the forefront of those ideas. Um, we will certainly be continuing the concert series next year um, uh, with, uh, with the music department. Um, I had a few preliminary discussions with actually another scale model solar system that NASA has been sponsoring. And so there were discussions of either uh, an on-campus planetary system that would show the whole uh, solar system on Agnes Scott campus, or maybe one that would be done in collaboration with the city of Decatur. Um, I started the talk with that Sky and Telescope article, and I'm really excited to tell you that my co-author on the book that's coming out um, in January of 2022, uh, Sarah Scholes is an Agnes Scott graduate, 
And she and I are currently working on a new feature article for Sky and Telescope um, that will be about small college observatories. And um, we're gonna try to make sure we provide them with the best photos of Agnes Scott College. So they'll pick one of those photos for the cover again, but you know, you, you can't be sure. And then as, as Amy mentioned uh, at the very beginning, um, I have accepted a, a two-year position uh, at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and I'll be on a two-year leave of absence up in Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, Ed Albin will be taking over as interim observatory director next year. And um, with that, and I think in the nick of time, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, again, thank you for being here on a Friday night. Thank you for being here. Uh, you know, I see many of your names and faces who've been coming back for years and years, and I, I truly appreciate your uh, dedication to the observatory. And you know, one thing that keeps the observatory going, probably the most important part is, uh, is all of you coming back, right? Wanting to be there, uh, wanting to look through those telescopes, uh, wanting to see a planetarium show and uh, ask all of your good questions. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. That was that was very interesting. Um, there have been um, a couple of questions I did uh, interrupt you for at least one of them. Um, there was a, a question which I took the liberty of answering. What were the most popular majors at the college today and where does astronomy rank? It just happened that our uh, vice president for academic <laughs> you know, the college sent the list. And, uh, you know, I could say that we're, um, you know, not the most popular major, but it is definitely in the top half of, of Agnes Scott majors. So. That's right. Um, and, I, and I will point out that I wrote back immediately to the dean and I said, well, if you add up astrophysics, math physics, physics, and computer science, which we teach the courses of, then we're in the top 10 majors. So uh, I think it's fair enough, right? As a department, we can claim all, all four of those majors. But yeah, that was good timing that that came out today. So if anybody has any questions, um, want to you know raise your hand or um, you know uh, pop a question here, we'd be happy to have Chris answer those. Yay, Sophia's here. <laughs> um, the there was one other thing about, and how did we how did we get it back? I'm not sure if I answered that. Um, I think we got it back by just saying we wanted it back because it wasn't being used. And so um, the fact that it wasn't uh, that the retrofit never um, never happened uh, was was kind of the motivation to to ask for it back. And Georgia State didn't really have a good reason why we couldn't get it back at that point. Um, oh, the name Beck came from. Yeah, uh, the Beck Telescope is because the Beck Corporation gave the college $20,000 to retrofit the telescope, right? So it was acquired for $15,000. I never realized that until I was actually doing some research for this talk. The telescope was bought for $15,000, which was apparently way below market. Like we underbid the Soviet Union by a factor of two. But then we put in another $20,000 from the Beck Corporation to make it usable uh, and also to make it usable at our latitude, right? Because, um, uh, because of the, the wedge piece that had to get put in. Yeah, there was a related question about the name Bradley. Um, and, you know, the Bradley, what was Bradley Observatory named for? I, I tried to answer, but if you wish to uh, answer that, please feel free. Oh, sure. Uh, uh, I'm sure you answered it fine. All I know is that there's the Bradley Foundation, uh, which gave the money for the building, basically. And um, the Bradley Foundation, I believe, is out of Augusta. Um, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a foundation that, that gives donations to various um, schools and organizations. And the idea there was, yeah, so the Bradley Observatory was named for the people who basically gave most of the funds to build the building. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I appreciate all of all of you. I mean, it's it's hard to think about leaving for a couple of years. Uh, you know, it's uh, this place, as you probably know, uh, this building has been my life and this program and my wonderful colleagues. And it's it's hard to to think about leaving for a couple of years. But um, 
you know, it, I think it's, it's, it's good for the observatory to have some new people who will be here for a couple of years. And uh, I think it's, it's good for all of us. I, I know Professor Lovell is very excited about uh, her sabbatical um, and there, that, that sort of rejuvenation uh, can be very important. I will say, I don't, I don't think I mentioned this, but, but actually Bill Calder um, took a leave of absence from the college in the late 60s. And what he did was he went and built, um, uh, he was the astronomer who designed Fernbank Science Center. So the telescope, the planetarium, all the stuff at Fernbank Science Center, he was the consulting astronomer on all of that. And he pushed for DeKalb County to do that. Um, he and his family lived in Avondale Estates. And so he was a, you know, he was a big part of the community. And so he actually left to do that for a couple of years and then came back to the college after that. He was a little bit older when he did that. And I think he retired pretty soon after, after he returned to the college then. Um, but, you know, his, it was the force of his reputation that pulled some very good people like George Folsom and Bob Hyde, right? Some of the other astronomers who were there in the 70s and 80s um, knew about Bill Calder. So one of the things that was really fantastic about him is that, is that you know, I still get letters from people who were kids <laughs> at the observatory with him. And, and also, right, he was a well-known researcher. And, and so he was appreciated um, for, for all of those things. Uh, let's see, thoughts about perseverance ingenuity. Um, well, uh, I, I, I'm, I don't know a lot about it other than probably what you all have seen in the news. Amy may have, have more to say, but I just have to say, I, I find all of that autonomous uh, flight just amazingly impressive, right? That you can have, uh, even though it's a slight little drone, that it can sort of figure out uh, takeoff and landing autonomously at the distance of Mars is just stunning, right? So. I, I look at it as kind of baby steps, right? I think it's a precursor for stuff that we'll try to do that'll be much more complicated, but you have to do the little things first. I don't know if you wanna jump in, Amy. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to, uh, to think about flying around on another planet. I, I can't resist um, with my, put my planetary science hat on. The atmosphere on Mars is 0.7%. So a little under 1% the atmospheric pressure of what we have on the earth. But the atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide which is a much heavier gas mass of 44 instead of a mass of 28 approximately for, for the earth. And so you might have wondered why it is that the, um, that the little um, drone, the helicopter has such a long wingspan or such a long rotor um, distance. And that's so that it can actually get lift in such a, um, in such a low density atmosphere. So um, that's part of why it, it looks very different than things like drones, which have little tiny, you know, like the <laughs> photography drones on the earth are, are much smaller. Something like that would be very difficult to get into flight on Mars. The other thing on Mars that's interesting is that because the atmosphere is so thin, um, not only is lift difficult, but the, the thermal environment is, is quite a challenge uh, there as well and, and power, getting power as well. So, so there's some very interesting stuff um, to, uh, to think about there, but yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what kind of scientific things come out of it. But as a technology demonstrator, it's very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see, I'm looking at questions. Sophia asks, oh, space debris, yes. There's a, there's a, a launch vehicle of a, of a Chinese um, uh, spacecraft. I think they launched another um, um, uh, orbiting platform. And uh, the problem is you've probably seen the impressive uh, videos of SpaceX, you know, launching something and then the launch craft come down and land, right? So that's sort of cream of the crop, right? What used to happen is that you would launch sort of to a suborbit and then it would just fall back down into the ocean. Um, I think the problem is that some of the Chinese launches, and this is just the way they've been doing their launches, is that the, the launch vehicle goes orbital and then decays in its orbit. And so the problem is that once it gets into orbit, it, because of thermal stresses and all sorts of other, other things, it'll start rotating and, um, and, and hitting the Earth's atmosphere. And so it comes in on a, a highly um, unpredictable trajectory. And so what I heard, Sophia, is that they won't know exactly where it's coming down uh, until it's a few hours before it's coming down. Um, and so I, I've, I know some governments, I think Russia has said, basically, it won't hit Russia. So they seem confident in that. But it's a big 
piece of equipment. I think I, I heard a description that it's sort of like a 10-story building. So it's a large piece of equipment. A lot of it will burn up. It'll break into pieces, but certainly not something you want raining down on, say, Chicago or New York, which it could, because the latitude range of where it could hit is, you know, plus 40 to minus 40 latitude. So, you know, all the major cities basically on the planet are within or close to that latitude range. Um, okay, so in the interest of not stretching your limits uh, for Zoom, late on a Friday night, um, I wanna turn things over to Sophia Gooch. Uh, Sophia is a rising senior at Agnes Scott and has been our outreach uh, fellow this year. Uh, hopefully will be our outreach fellow next year. Um, keep your fingers crossed. The Georgia Space Grant Consortium thinks that we're still doing good things. Um, and uh, Sophia is going to give us a short planetarium show. So take it away, Sophia. Thank you. I will try and do this super smoothly um, and share the right screen. Um, I think we're good, right? You guys see a uh, Stellarium? <laughs> see your Stellarium. Yes, awesome, okay. Um, so before I start and go off on some very different subjects, I just wanna thank Dr. Dupree and Dr. Lovell for being here and basically driving this whole show, uh, more than this specific show. Um, it's been really great, my whole experience with y'all and I'm gonna miss both of you cause you're both leaving next year. So I find that incredibly unfair, but you know, life happens, you guys have great opportunities. So I'm happy for you guys, but I will miss you. Um, and thank you to everyone who's still sticking around at 9.05 p.m. Um, on a Friday. And so tonight I just wanna talk a bit about what's in the sky and a little bit about what you can expect for the summer because it's May and we have some very different stuff in the sky than we did in say December. Um, so tonight, it's not, this is, this is the current time in Stellarium, but this, this isn't very great. So I'm going to try and time travel us a little bit later where things are darker and higher up in the sky. Oh yes, this, this should do. So you may notice there's a, there's a few things in the sky and one in particular seems pretty bright and that's Vega. So tonight I will be specifically talking about Vega and more specifically the constellation it's a part of, which is Lyra. And I can go ahead and turn on constellations because some, some of these things are a bit hard to imagine, you know, by yourself with just imagination, but luckily we have some lines here. Uh, so Lyra, the constellation itself, lies in the northern sky and we live in the northern hemisphere. So this is the sky we're seeing tonight. And the Lyra itself represents the lyre, and I'm not calling you guys lyres, that's a, that's a musical instrument. And the constellation is usually associated with the myth of the Greek musician and poet Orpheus. And there was actually a very recent Broadway musical that came out that involved Orpheus, it's called Hades Town, but I don't know anything about musical theater, so that's not what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, so it was first cataloged way back when in the past by the astronomer Ptolemy in the second century, so a, a little bit ago, and it contains Vega, which is the fifth brightest star in the sky and the second brightest star in the northern hemisphere. It's a very, very bright guy. And it also, Lyra also contains the famous variable star, RR Lyra. And now RR Lyra may be how you read it. It's literally R R Lyra, but it's sometimes called like Delta squared Lyra. So I'm so sorry to have named this because I could be mispronouncing it or calling it the wrong thing. But uh, if you look at all the stars inside, the brightest stars in Lyra, you'll see one that's a little bit different. And if I scroll in, this is Delta squared Lyra or R R Lyra. And it's a bit different than the rest of the stars because it is a variable star. Uh, so a variable star is a star that's brightness changes and it acts a bit like a lighthouse out in space for us. And um, the specific variable star in Lyra is a specific subset of a variable called an RR Lyra variable. <laughs> so it kind of sets the trend for the rest of the variables that are similar to it. And um, basically the RR Lyra variable has a really small dense core and a large, much less dense envelope. And the RR Lyra variable 
um, inside of it, only the envelope expands and contracts. So the core remains constant in size and produces the same amount of energy at the same rate but the envelope is expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting. So its surface temperature is changing and it looks like a bit like it's blinking or pulsing in space. And um, this means that its temperature changes and a lot of other fun science stuff, but I won't bore you. Uh, so the Lyra constellation is also home to several uh, deep sky objects, which we actually have a button for. So I will turn that on. And now zoom out a little bit. Lyra is a little bit big. So we have one specific object here is the ring nebula. And um, it's actually called the planetary nebula Messier 57, but that's a little bit of a long name. So we can just call it the ring nebula. It does not look a whole lot like anything else out here. Uh, so this lovely zoomed in high quality image gives you a great idea of what the uh, uh, ring nebula looks like. And there are a few other things like emerging triplet of galaxies. Um, and you'll notice a lot of these, specifically these guys, have the same title in the front. And that's because there apparently was only like three people who discovered the first million stars. So they got to name all of them. And <laughs> so it makes it a great fun time for the rest of us memorizing these stars. Um, but now I'm gonna talk more about Vega specifically. So Vega is actually pretty easy to find in the night sky. As you saw earlier, um, when we were more zoomed out, it's really bright. <laughs> um, so it's also because it's part of a very familiar summer object that some people may have heard of. It's called a summer triangle. So um, the summer triangle is formed from the stars Altair, Deneb, and Vega. And if I zoom out a little bit, you'll see all three of them. So I'll try and get all three. Here we go. Altair, Deneb, and Vega. So Altair is the eagle, Aquila, and Deneb is inside of the constellation Cygnus, the swan. Obviously, right? This is super clear. Well, just in case it's not super clear what they are, I will turn on the art. <laughs> so here we have the swan, the eagle, and the lyre. Um, so the summer triangle is one of the most familiar patterns in the northern summer sky. So during the summer, it's super noticeable. And it's about as noticeable as I would say Orion is in the winter. So in the winter, when you want to find something in the sky super easy, super fast, if you want to show off, you look for Orion. Very simple, very easy to find, three stars in a row, super bright. The summer triangle is basically the equivalent of that during the summer. So you look up, you find one of these bright guys and you can draw a triangle. Uh, so if you're looking for it, you can look for first the swan here, obviously in the night sky, just super clear swan you see in the sky and then look above it for Vega. And actually the summer triangle was referred to as the navigators triangle by the US military. So navigators used to use this before GPS systems were invented and other navigational equipment became much easier. And uh, Vega is located at the vertex of the triangle. So it's super easy to find. So if you're in the US military and don't have a GPS system, just use the summer triangle to get somewhere. And Vega was actually the first star other than the sun to be photographed, which is kind of crazy to think about. And uh, it was also the first one to have its spectrum recorded. So someone super awesome and deeply involved in astrophysics must have done this, right? Taking a picture of Vega, because a uh, sky object, well, Actually, it was a amateur astronomer who really liked taking photos of space and his name was Henry Draper. He was actually a doctor, did not work in this field, but he had a really strong passion for it. It was a big hobby of his. So he's actually the guy who took the first photograph of Vega and like the first photograph of any star besides the sun. So thank you, Henry, for that. Um, and Vega is also, this is going to be a little more science fiction than science in general, but some of you may have heard of this. Vega was the first, was the source of the alien signal in the movie Contact. So if anyone here has ever seen Contact with Jodie Foster, 
great movie, highly recommend, based on the book Contact by Carl Sagan. Um, they get a signal from space that points to alien life. It's all about SETI, if anyone's heard of that. That's a completely different talk, though. Could go on forever. So <laughs> this signal comes out somewhere from space, and when they look for the source, it's coming from Vega in Lyra. So if you have seen this movie or know someone who does, head on outside this summer and be like, you know where that signal came from? It's right there. Well, that swan shape. So go, go ahead and show off about that. And lastly, or not lastly, because there's a bit more to talk about with Vega. Vega is actually used um, as the comparison for all other sky objects brightness. So it's super bright, right? And it's magnitude. And magnitude in space talk is basically the apparent brightness in our night sky. So it's how bright it appears to be is the magnitude. And um, its magnitude is traditionally rated as zero. So it's basically what everyone else uses to compare other brightness to. And telescopic observations in 2006, fun fact, revealed Vega is whipping around so quickly that its poles are several thousand degrees warmer than the equator, and the star rotates every 12.5 hours. And all this means that it's at 90% of its critical rotation speed. So the critical rotation speed is the speed at which the object tears itself apart. So Vega's barely still Vega, like 10% more and it would tear itself apart. It wouldn't even be here anymore. Now I'm gonna stop talking a bit about the past and talk a little bit more about the future, which isn't something we do too often in astrophysics. We're a lot about the history kind of people, but Vega is actually a future North Star and our current North Star is Polaris. The North, uh, you might've heard that before, Polaris, the North Star. And it was also a past North Star. So our planet's precession causes the poles to change. And now precession is basically when if you have a spinning top, it doesn't spin perfectly pointing the same way. It spins a bit like this. So its axis actually points a little bit of a different direction as it's spinning and the earth, as we know, is rotating. And so as it rotates, the axis starts to point slightly different places and it's actually a 47 degree circle. And every 26,000 years, just a short amount of time, it points to a new star. So for now it points to Polaris, but Vega will be the North Star in about 12,000 years. So almost a little more than half, a little less than halfway there. I can I do math all the time. And it used to be the North Star in 12,000 BC. So just a little bit ago. And that's a little bit of the history of Vega, uh, the past and future and a little bit about Lyra and keep your eye out for the summer triangle this summer. And any, if anyone has any questions, I'm willing to take them, but I know it's late and I know you guys have things to do. So thank you so much for coming and I will stop sharing now. Thank you, Sophia, that was great. Well done. And, uh, and what a perfect constellation to pick on the night when I talked about Bill Calder so much since he played the harp, right? Uh, that was a lovely choice. Um, Thank you for all your work this year uh, on our outreach. And um, uh, I, th I think you'll have a lot of fun working with Ed Alban next year. He's a, he's a great person and uh, he knows all about the observatory. He knows how to, to use the Beck and the planetarium. And uh, I think Professor Lovell and I are gonna try to make sure he's comfortable with the Sarah telescope. So hopefully he'll be up to speed on everything. All right, my friends, uh, it is late, it is Friday night. Thank you so much for being here. Again, I can't, I can't say it enough. Uh, the one thing I had to say, remember I told you that year, 1999 to 2000, which was when we were out of the observatory. One of the most depressing nights maybe of my life was the last open house of that year. Uh, it was me and a student, uh, Nola Taylor, and nobody came, uh, nobody. We weren't in the observatory. There had been like a mix up with the announcement. Nobody came. So Nola and I just sat there and sort of looked sad for a while and then went home. So thank you in the middle of the pandemic for being here, uh, all of you. Um, uh, my heart goes out to all of you. Hopefully we're almost through this uh, heck of a year and uh, we, can, we can move back to normal normality soon. So I hope you have a lovely summer, everybody. 
Um, uh, stay safe, stay well, and uh, see you all very soon, I hope. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Thanks for being here, everybody. Thanks, and thanks, Sophia. Nice job. Well done. Hopefully see you all in person next time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We'll be back there soon. Okay, I'm going to stop our recording.